What's this? A letter for me. Welcome to another episode of Remember the Great Sports Through the Mail Thursdays. Today I'm going to share with you three recent returns that I got back in the mail. So let's just jump right into this. And the first return is from former New York Met, Dennis Rybent on one, two, a third. These are the only three cards I have besides this one as him as a Detroit Tiger. So let me tell you about Dennis Ribbent and his career in baseball. Dennis grew up in Detroit, Michigan where he attended high school at St. Joseph High School in Detroit. He signed with the Milwaukee Braves in 1961 as an amateur free agent. He spent some time in the minor leagues with the Braves organization, and on August 8, 1964, three years after he became pro, he was traded with cash to the New York Mets for pitcher Frank Larry. Well, after joining the Mets that year in 64, which were a pretty bad team, Dennis got a chance to start seven games, but he appeared in 14 total, but his record was just 1-5 that year for the Mets to end the season. Well, going into the 1965 season, the Mets primarily put him in the bullpen, where he had a respectable 3.82 ERA with a 1-3 record. Well, the following year, in 1966, the Mets decided to give him a chance to be a starter again, where he started 26 games out of 39, and actually posted an 11-9 record with a 3.20 ERA for the Mets that season. Despite coming off a career best at that point in his career, 11-win season, the Mets decided to trade him to the Pittsburgh Pirates for Don Bosch and Don Cardwell. Well, he would spend one season with Pittsburgh before they would trade him to the Detroit Tigers. The Tigers would only keep him for a half a season before they traded him in July of 1968 to the Chicago White Sox. Well, after the season ended with his time with the White Sox, the Tigers decided to get him back from the White Sox. However, they didn't hold on to him long because they decided then to sell him to the Kansas City Royals. He never appeared in a game with the Royals before they sent him to St. Louis. The Cardinals would only hold on to him for a little while. On June of 1969, they would then trade him to the Cincinnati Reds. He would finish out the year with the Reds, and then the Reds would trade him before the 1970 season to the Pittsburgh Pirates. Well, the Pirates in 1970 did not call him up to a game, and he spent the entire year in AAA posting a 14-9 record. Despite this, the Pirates decided to let him go, and he then went and played for the expansion team San Diego Padres for two seasons in their AAA affiliate. And despite posting a 15 wins and 7 loss record for the AAA affiliate of the Padres, they did not call him up to the major leagues, which is surprising. It's the Padres, and they were an expansion team, so how good of of a team could they really had they didn't give this guy a chance despite posting the 15 wins in triple a for him well the next year in 72 he returned to triple a for the padres where his record fell to just eight and nine and an era of over five after the 72 season the padres let him go and he signed a minor league deal with the philadelphia phillies he only pitched in 10 games for the phillies triple a affiliate before he was let go of his contract. So in total, he played for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven teams in the majors as a pitcher, and a few other teams in the minor leagues as a pitcher. So this was quite a well-traveled man, so to speak, as it almost seemed like every year he was in a different location with the exception of his first few years with the Mets. I mean, in just a short period of time, you know, the decade that he spent as a player, or a little more than a decade, he played for almost a dozen teams, it seemed. So, very happy to add uh, Dennis Rybent to the collection. Never got him before, and we'll move on to the next one. All right, this next one's postmarked from Miami, Florida, and it is from former Houston 
Colt 45 slash Astro Sonny Jackson slash Atlanta Brave Sonny Jackson who also coached as you can see for a long time in the Brave system so let me tell you about the fast running Sonny Jackson and his playing career and his coaching career Jackson, a Maryland native, went to high school in Maryland, and he signed with the Houston Colt 45s prior to the 1963 season. Well, immediately the Colt 45s, being a new team, put Jackson in their A-ball affiliate where he appeared in 139 games in A-ball, batting 297 and stealing 56 bases that year. Well, he got a chance to play in one game in 1963 in the majors at just 18 years old where he did not get a hit at all, but he did make an appearance. Well, in 1964, he would start the season out again in double A, and he would repeat that year where he stole 45 stolen bases and batted 285, and again would get called up for nine games with the Colt 45s. Well, in 1965, he would be in Triple A, where this time he would steal 52 bases, batting 300, and would get some limited time in 1965, appearing in 10 games. Well, in 1966, the starting job was pretty much his for the Astros at shortstop. At just 21 years old, he appeared in 150 games. He batted 292 and stole 49 bases that year for the. Houston Colt 45s. The following year, he would appear in 129 games for the team, but his batting average would dip down to 237 and he would just steal 22 bases. Well, after the 1967 season, the Astros would then trade him to the Atlanta Braves for pitcher Denny LeMaster and Dennis Meek. Well, with the Braves, he would get a second chance, appearing in 105 games that year for the Braves in 1968. And he would bat just 226, but would steal 16 bases. The following year, he would be used primarily as a backup, and at just 24 years old, he appeared in 98 games. Well, in 1970 and 71, he got a little more experience, where he appeared in 103 and 149 games for the Braves that year. But in 1972, he continued to struggle, and appeared in just 60 games, and was sent down to the minor leagues, to appear in 20 games for the Braves to finish out the year. Well, in 1973, the Braves gave him another crack at a starting role where he appeared in 117 games for the team that year, but batted just 209 for the team. And in 1974, he found himself back in AAA for the majority of the season, where he got a chance to appear in five games for the Braves in 1974. This would mark the last time that Jackson would appear in the major leagues. Following the 74 season, he would sign with the San Diego Padres, where he would spend an entire year in AAA for them. In the following year, in 1976, at 31, he would sign with the White Sox and play in 84 games for them in their AAA affiliate, posting a 273 batting average that year. Well, after that season, he retired from being a player and a few years later, he resurfaced in coaching positions with the Atlanta Braves. And this is him in uh, the late 80s on a couple cards. And uh, Bruce Dow Canton has unfortunately passed away, so I won't be able to get him to sign that. But he also coached with the Giants organization and the Cubs organization before he officially retired from baseball. So very happy to add Mr. Jackson to my collection. Never gotten him before. I would love to get Chuck Harrison to sign that card. However, um, my resources when I was checking hasn't shown a success from Chuck Harrison at all. So if anybody can come up with a good success address on Chuck Harrison, definitely let me know. I would love to send it his way and get it signed, but I definitely don't want to take a shot in the dark and lose this Sonny Jackson autograph by sending it to a black hole, so to speak. So, moving on to the next one. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. All right, so this next one is postmarked from Tennessee. And it is former Chicago Cub great Don Kessinger on one, two, a third one, and a tops deckle makes a fourth. 
which uh, if you remember a couple years ago, Topps Heritage put those as inserts in their sets. And uh, also Topps Heritage did this as well, I believe, as a design. Actually, they probably did all these designs at one time or another. So Kessinger, an Arkansas native, attended the University of Mississippi in Oxford as a baseball player. He signed as a free agent in 1964 with the Chicago Cubs. He would spend very little time in the minors, starting out in 77 games his first year in 1964 with the Cubs. And then he would get a call-up late in the season where he would appear in four games in the 64 season. Well, in 65, he would return to the minor leagues for just 46 games. But after those 46 games, he would be called up in the 65 season. It would remain a mainstay for the Chicago Cubs thereafter for many, many years. In his first full season with the Cubs, he appeared in 106 games, but just batted 201 that year for the Cubs, but was superb in the field. Well, he worked with a uh, hitting coach, and they improved his hitting skills. And in 1966, he had the opportunity to improve his batting average to 274 that year while leading off for the Cubs. This would be a position that he would hold for many years as the Cubs' leadoff hitter. And in 1968, he would make his first All-Star game that he would consecutively appear in 68, 69, 70, 71, and 72 in the All-Star Classic for the Chicago Cubs. He would also make another appearance in 1974 with the Cubs as an All-Star. He would play a total of 12 years for the Chicago Cubs through the 1975 season. At 33 years old, the Cubs decided to trade Kessinger to the St. Louis Cardinals for Mike Garman. And he would stay with the Cardinals until, until August of 1977 when the Cardinals would then ship him to the Chicago White Sox. At this point, Kessinger was 34 years old and he would remain with the White Sox for three more seasons through 1979. An interesting fact about Kessinger was is during the 1979 season, he was the player manager for the team for the majority of the year. Kessinger held the position as player manager until he decided to resign on August 2nd, 1979, and the man that replaced him would be future Hall of Famer Tony La Russa. So after his retirement from baseball, Kessinger enjoyed pretty much of a decade away from the limelight, started a family, he focused on working with his uh, children, Keith Kessinger and Kevin Kessinger, who both played professionally in baseball. And in 1991, Kessinger returned to his alma mater in Mississippi and coached them for six years, compiling a record of 185 wins and 153 losses as the head coach of the University of Mississippi. So in addition to all of the years that he spent in the major leagues, he has gone into the Chicago Cubs Hall of Fame. He's also been inducted into the Mississippi Hall of Fame, University of Mississippi Hall of Fame. And I actually just read in 2021 that Mississippi finally retired his number, the University of Mississippi. I don't know if he wore the same number as a player and as a coach. I apologize about not knowing that information. But in total, he was a six-time All-Star, a two-time Gold Glove winner, and a superb fielder in the field. And I want to thank Mr. Kessinger for signing for me. And one more neat note, uh, aside from his two sons that played, he now has a grandson playing in the Astros organization named Gray Kessinger. So that is actually his grandson. So uh, Gray, I believe, is still playing in double A at this point. And as of me shooting this video, has not made a major league debut, but be looking for Gray Kessinger, maybe playing for the Astros. And that is Don Kessinger's grandson. So I want to thank Mr. Kessinger for signing. I want to obviously thank Mr. Dennis Rybent for signing those four cards for me as well. I also want to thank Mr. Sonny Jackson for signing the coaching cards that I happen to have of him, but of course his rookie card as well. I want to thank you, the viewer, for taking the time to watch another episode of Through the Mail Thursdays. Please leave your comments below. And let me know what you think of some of these vintage autographs. Happy collecting. <laughs>